Episode 40, Marketing Maven, Seth Godin. Welcome to The Art of Excellence, a show about people doing extraordinary things in their lives. I'm your host, Glenn Zweig. Thanks for joining me. My guest today is Seth Godin. Seth is an entrepreneur, a best-selling author, and a speaker. He has written 19 best-selling books, publishes one of the most popular marketing blogs, and speaks to audiences around the world. He also founded two companies, Squidoo and Yo-Yo Dine, which was acquired by Yahoo. Seth has been inducted into both the Direct Marketing Hall of Fame and the Marketing Hall of Fame. His latest book is called, This is Marketing. You can't be seen until you learn to see. Seth, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. It's a privilege. So Seth, you're the successful serial entrepreneur and a highly accomplished author and a speaker. Yet I've heard you often describe yourself as a teacher, first and foremost. So why is that? What entrepreneurs mostly do especially if they've raised money from other people, is seek monopoly power to create value for investors by creating a situation where your customers don't have many, many choices. Because if they don't have a lot of choices, they have to pay extra. And what a teacher does is embrace abundance instead of scarcity. And the idea of abundance is says that there's plenty here you could learn something new, you could contribute more, you could level up. And so I've been teaching since I was 17 years old. And it's the thing that I'm constantly drawn to. So now I run the Alt MBA, I run the marketing seminar, the bootstrappers workshop, the podcast fellowship, the food, the business of food workshop. And what we're doing is helping tens of thousands of people to see what's possible. And I teach when I'm on stage and I teach when I'm writing and I teach when I have my small team in the studio here. So that's what I am. I'm a teacher. It's interesting. So you actually get more fulfillment out of teaching others how to market, how to create new businesses and scale them than you do actually doing it yourself, given that you're a serial entrepreneur. Yeah, I I think that the building part is very similar. When you are uh, trying to build an institution, unless you're a complete uh, technophile or you're based on extracting minerals from the ground, almost every other institution that's built is built with people and for people. So that craft is aligned with what you do when you're teaching in a non-bureaucratic setting, which is you're helping people become who they seek to become. And so I distinguish all of this from the bureaucracy of compliance, which is what most traditional schools are about. Before we get to the book, there is a recent blog post of yours that's really intriguing to me. I'm going to just read it. What if you pretended that you were glad to see me, happy to deliver the service, eager for it to be well received? What if you acted as though You are more charismatic than you feel, more confident, more competent. What if you demonstrated optimism about what's about to happen next, even if you're not sure? It takes effort, more than most of us can expend day in and day out. But what if you invested that effort just for a little while? It's entirely possible that acting as if would actually create the very outcome you're hoping for. So Seth, what's the inspiration behind that post? You know, I got some notes from people who didn't understand it. And uh, they felt like I was encouraging people to fake it all day. And that there's already enough demands on our uh, emotional energy to fake it, that that wasn't fair. And that's not what I'm talking about at all. What I'm talking about is there are emotional choices we make every day, and some of them are self-fulfilling. 
that if you're cranky and you act cranky, you will become more cranky, not less cranky. That if you work in any setting where the interactions between people matter, then being optimistic and generous in your interactions actually makes it more likely that the interactions will work, which will make you more optimistic and generous. So I guess what I'm talking about is the fork in the road. And I spend a lot of time marveling with sadness at how corporations force human beings to act like senseless, mindless cogs in a system, as opposed to taking responsibility for the work they do. And it's such a waste of human capital. And I know that that's what you do for a living is human capital. And I don't know why you'd spend all the time and money to hire someone, train someone, and then say, and now you have to do everything this way because I said so, right? That's just the path to AI. Great. If an AI can do a job better than a human, that's what's going to happen. But it feels to me like the real way to add value is to have humans who act like humans instead. I like that. So the subtitle of this recent book of yours, This Is Marketing, is You Can't Be Seen Until You Learn to See. Why did you choose that? The original subtitle was Make Things Better by Making Better Things. But I'm not very good at titling my work, and my publisher is, so I let Adrian run with this one, and he was correct. The argument I'm making is that the narcissism, the short-term selfish shortcutting uh, narcissism of the traditional marketer is selfish. It goes from everyone from an executive recruiter to a garden supply store. The person who's selling thinks that they deserve everyone's attention. They think that their needs are everyone's needs. Mm -hmm. And in the old days, if you had money, you could buy attention. Money bought you attention at a discount and you could use that attention to grow your business. Today, attention is too precious for you to be able to buy it at almost any cost. And so you don't get to sell to me because you want to. You get to sell to me because I want to. And therefore, what it means to be a marketer of anything is to have the practical empathy to see what the other person dreams of and what they fear. So just to build on that for a minute, you mentioned in the book that for most of your life, marketing was advertising. So is the underlying point that in this day and age, advertising's effect is a fraction of where it used to be? Or is it just as relevant, but maybe it's taken a different shape in the world of digital media? No, the, the evidence is profound, right? That Google, Facebook, Amazon, Airbnb, tell me about their ads. They don't have any, or if they do, they're terrible. None of these organizations were built with advertising, right? Go down the list of McKinsey or Russell Reynolds or anybody else you want to mention. Where are their advertisements? I don't know. You know, that there was this time when the big X number of accounting firms, what is it now, three, four, all ran the same ads in airports with people wearing those hats, remember? They were like black and white derbies. Yeah, I do. No one could tell which one was which. It didn't matter. The advertising didn't matter. That what has happened since 1997 is not one, not one significant brand has been built with consumer advertising. Not one. Whereas before 1997, every consumer brand was built that way. And so I think we've got to notice that. We've got to acknowledge it, that important, profitable companies still run ads, but they're not important and profitable because they run ads. They run ads because they're important and profitable. So we're just a couple weeks removed from the Super Bowl. I believe 30 second spots sold for over $5 million. So do you think that was just like a colossal waste of money for companies that spent it? Of course it was. There is uh, one specific exception, two specific exceptions. One exception is there are brands that can measure what happens during halftime in such a way that they know the ad paid for itself. Doritos, for example, mm -hmm. that $5 million on a Doritos ad in the first quarter pays for itself during halftime because enough people go to the store for a refill that you just made the ad work. But then the second one is any brand that's using it as a signaling strategy. 
And the signaling strategy is, is to be able to say to the stock market or to investors or to partners, we are so successful, we can burn $5 million in, in, a, in a parking lot on fire. Um, and in both of those cases, it can be argued that it pays for itself. But in general, the thing to remember is you are paying a premium to reach more people all at once. That only makes sense if you seek mass, but there are no important brands that seek mass anymore. They seek specific. So why would you pay extra to reach the people you don't want to reach when for less money, you could reach just the people you do want to reach. And so that leads us to the internet because the internet, even though more people use it than television, the internet is not a mass medium. It is a micro medium. Mm -hmm. It is a micro medium with a billion channels. And so you can pick a very, very, very specific cohort of people, right? You can reach left-handed people who are within 10 mile drive of Tulane University. You can't do that in any other medium and you pay for specificity. So all of the thinking about mass marketing is now obsolete because there's no advantage to being a mass marketer anymore. There's an advantage to being a specific marketer. Another quote from the book is, what you say isn't nearly as important as what others say about you. Now, first of all, I agree 100%. I guess in the vernacular of digital marketers, the earned media uh, is far more important than the owned and the paid media. I guess the challenge is you can control your own messaging, but obviously you can't control your audience. So what's a marketer to do? It sort of bothers me that you... Uh, dismissed the single most important thing marketers get to do okay. with a dismissal, right? Why isn't that enough? Why isn't it enough to simply make something great that people want to talk about? That, why isn't that marketing, right? So my point is that the TV-based, narcissistic, short-term vision of marketing is that the chief marketing officer gets a pile of money and an average product for average people and her job is to go spin it and hype it with things that she can control. That's not marketing anymore. That wasn't marketing before 1950 and it's not marketing anymore. That that parentheses is over. And what we are left with is if you build a network effect, if you understand people's status roles, if you engage with people where they need to be with a product or service that helps them get to where they want to go, that is marketing. And, you know, so when I was at Yahoo, mm -hmm. one of the giant challenges there is there were only two people in the marketing department and I wasn't allowed to join the marketing department because they didn't think marketing mattered because they thought marketing was the ad that they ran on the outside of the hotel on 101 that they had traded for some rooms and then they bought a billboard someplace. That's not marketing, right? And that during Yahoo's heyday, they succeeded because using Yahoo was the marketing of Yahoo. And the reason Yahoo faded away was because bad product choices got made. Not because bad, bad marketing choices got made, except that marketing and product choices are the same thing. And so, you know, they just shut down uh, yet another uh, Google project that was supposed to change the world. That was the Google Plus community mm -hmm. uh, social thing. Was that because they had bad marketing? Or was it because they built a product that no one really wanted because it didn't satisfy their needs? So what I'm arguing is the marketing people have to be in charge of all of it. They have to be in charge of customer service. They have to be in charge of product development. They have to be in charge of the downstream side effects of what they make. They have to be in charge of hiring because marketing is the word we use to describe how human beings are going to interact with what you make and whether or not they will talk about it and miss you if you're gone. So it has to be a much more holistic role, if I'm hearing you correctly. Like advertising is just one small piece of a much broader uh, mandate. Call the advertising department the advertising department. But when I'm busy talking to a CMO who pretends they're a marketer, it takes me only like three minutes to figure out they're not a marketer. They're just in charge of the advertising department. So I was thinking about some recent purchases I made over the last couple of weeks. I bought some new tires for my car. Uh, I got a haircut and uh, I bought an electric toothbrush. Uh, I know what you're thinking. 
a very exciting life. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, honestly, I'm, uh, I'm actually happy with all three of the purchases. But here's the thing. I'm not going to go review them on Yelp. I'm not going to go talk to them, to my friends over Facebook. I uh, even mention them to my coworkers. So I guess I'm wondering, are there only certain kinds of products or service categories that have such an impact, you know, such an emotional impact as to trigger that word of mouth effect? Okay, so let's talk about all three products. Uh, tires are generally sold as a good enough commodity, meaning that based on your perception of your status, you will buy a tire that you believe to be in your category that is good enough, but you're never going to talk about it because it's a commodity. And in the age of the internet, that's a problem because you go to Tire Rack, you sort by price, and you just buy the cheapest one that's good enough. Let's compare that to the Michelin Restaurant Guide. The Michelin Restaurant Guide has turned the Michelin brand into the most trusted one in Europe because it gave people something to talk about. Talking about a Michelin rating is fun. Talking about a Michelin rating is a way of communicating to others who you think you are. So that act on Michelin's part 50 years ago was brilliant because they gave people something to talk about and it creates an umbrella that says a Michelin tire is a non-commodity product. It must be because I've been talking about the other thing they do all the time. Electric toothbrushes are this other situation though, where again, it's a commodity product in the sense that I go on Amazon, I look for the one where the intersection of reviews and price matches my self-perception. But there's nothing to talk about because it's weird to talk about how I brush my teeth. However, just about everybody who buys an electric toothbrush is gonna talk to their dentist. And so the way to win the electric toothbrush battle is to give the patient something to talk about with the dentist and to give the dentist something to talk about with the patient. So the way I could imagine doing that is using the Internet of Things mindset and saying, this will generate a report that you can hand to your dentist when you go. If that starts to happen, dentists will say to patients, would you please bring me your toothbrushing report so I can understand what's going on in your mouth? Now the patient has a, a status dominance issue here, which is they want to affiliate with the dentist, and that means they got to go buy this toothbrush. And then the third one is the haircut. And that's the easiest one to talk about because the fact is, particularly among women, if you get a good haircut, people will say to you, oh, you got a good haircut. It looks great. You must respond by telling them the name of the person who cut your hair. If you don't, you have broken a social contract. What's interesting about this is no one says that about getting a massage. That no one says it looks like you just got a great massage. And that's why it's easier to build a successful haircutting studio than it is to build a massage studio because people don't talk about it. And the last thing I'll add on that riff is I was helping a professional I know who does things like massage. And the fact was no one was talking about his work. So I said, here's what you do in November. You give all your best clients five gift certificates. And the gift certificates are really simple. They say, this is good for a free treatment and it's not, available, not valid for previous clients. So you give someone five of those. Now, that person has five things worth $150 each. They could throw them out or they could give them to people as gifts. Now I have something to talk about because it makes me look generous to give this to my friend. And my friend, if he has a great experience, might become a regular customer. So again, what I'm arguing about here is in all three cases, if you think about it from an industrialist point of view, you will make a commodity. And if you make a commodity, sort by price will kill you. But if you think about it like a marketer, you'll say, where's the network effect? How do I build something actually worth talking about so that people trust me more and are eager to hear what I have to say? I'm fascinated with this story in the book you mentioned of Vision Spring. Uh, it's a company providing affordable reading glasses to the poor. And how one seemingly minor tweak you made instantly doubled their sales. Could you share that story? Okay. It, it takes a couple of minutes, but I'll try to, to give the digested version. In India, there are a billion people 
and approximately 100 million of them need reading glasses. Uh, just because as soon as any human hits 50, you need reading glasses. And in the old days around the world, when you hit 50, you were dead. But now people are living to 70 or 80, which means there's 20 or 30 years where you can't do your weaving, you can't do your close needlework, you can't do anything that requires you to see things up close. A pair of reading glasses can be purchased at a Chinese factory for two bucks. What we have here is a distribution and an education problem, which is there's 100 million people who probably could find $3 to buy these reading glasses, creating enough of a profit for the company to do it again and again and again, but don't have access to them or haven't been educated to why they need it. So I went with Vision Spring to this little village and it was 110 degrees out and we can rent City Hall for a dollar and there's nothing to do. So everyone lines up to see what's going on in City Hall. There's like 50 people in line and I could see the men and the women who were in line, they were wearing traditional uh, Indian work shirts and in their front pocket, I could see the money. So we're talking to people who make $3 a day. Uh, this is a very big purchase. They have the money and we know by biology that they need the glasses. And they get up to the front of the line and first they sit down and they take a reading test, not dependent on literacy. So we know that everyone can take the reading test and almost everyone fails the reading test because they're 50. And then they're handed a pair of sample glasses and they can pass the reading test. So what do we know now? We know that they need glasses. We know that they just saw the glasses work. We know that glasses are not an alien technology that requires batteries or other fanciness. And we know they have enough money to buy the glasses. So then we take back the sample glasses and they go to the next table where there are 10 individually wrapped styles of brand new glasses, each one more stylish than the next, all the same price. And two thirds of the people in line don't buy anything. They just leave. And I'm standing there and I'm trying to figure this out. Like, what was that about? And what I realized after an hour is we lacked the empathy to understand that for a lot of people, the majority of people on this planet, shopping is not fun. Shopping is a threat. Shopping is a chance to make a mistake. That when we shop, we shop for fun because if we're wrong, we'll buy something else tomorrow. But if you are poor, your parents were poor, your grandparents were poor, shopping has never been something you did. You replenished. You, when something ran out, you got more of it. But you didn't say, let's go to the tobacco store and see what's new. That's too scary. Because if you're wrong, someone's not going to eat. If you're really wrong, someone might die. So what I did was I got rid of all 10 sample glasses, all 10 choices. And so now we say, all right, here, try these on. They work. You want to keep them? Because if you want to keep them, you got to give me $3. Or you can give them back and go back to not being able to see. So that's fear of loss, not desire for gain. Because now you have something on your face that works. You can keep it. Just give me three bucks. We're done. That shift matched the way that person wanted to be engaged with. And that's why we doubled the sales. Wow. It, it's pretty amazing how sometimes pretty small changes can have such a profound impact. You know, the hindsight's so easy, but honestly, I mean, Seth, I could have sat there for days and days and days trying to come up with what was wrong and had increased velocity, and I would have just been sitting there scratching my head. Okay, so a lot of us are pretty familiar with the term minimal viable product, but you bring up something in the book that I believe you coined called smallest viable market. So what exactly is it uh, and why is it so important? Yeah, I invented that. It's a really important idea. Most organizations average their stuff out to reach the largest group of people. They spend time and money to reach ever more people. And in the era of mass, you can do the math. That makes sense because each incremental audience gets cheaper and cheaper. Once Budweiser is being consumed by 60% of the public, getting from 60 to 70 is cheaper than getting from zero to 10 because you have distribution, you have Super Bowl ads, you have the rest. All that's gone now. Mass distribution is gone. Mass marketing is gone. Mass advertising is gone. Mass manufacturing is gone. No advantage to mass anymore. It's now a tax. It's not a benefit. 
So my argument is pick the smallest possible group of people that could sustain you and delight them because they will then tell their colleagues, they will tell their friends. So my friend Beth is one of the leading recruiters of a certain kind of analyst for a certain kind of Wall Street firm. Well, if you're one of those firms, of course you need to hire Beth because she's the best in the world at what she does. And if you're one of those kinds of analysts, of course you need to know Beth because she's got all the good jobs. And so she doesn't need more than 30 clients a year. 30 clients a year is a huge number of people to keep one recruiter busy. By obsessing about the smallest viable audience, not saying, how do I hire more people to get more clients, to hire more people to get more clients to be the biggest one? She's the important one. And that creates huge benefits to the quality of her work and to the decreasing the cost of her customer acquisition. So if I were to try to simplify, is it essentially thinking small? I mean, is that the point of it? It's about thinking important and thinking specific. Okay. You can be important and specific. It doesn't matter how big you are because it's better to be important and specific. So if you're this, let's say this friend of yours, the uh, executive search consultant, and they focus on a very specific niche, uh, they've got their brand, they own that audience, they make a nice living, and they're very happy. I mean, I say kudos to them. But now let's switch gears and let's say you're a Fortune 100 company, a Fortune 500 company, and it's only interesting if a new business, uh, a new product, has the potential to scale to billions and billions of dollars. So I guess the question is, you know, how do you advise them? How do you both make sure you have something that's specific enough to capture an audience where something really resonates, but yet know that it has the potential to broaden way, way, way beyond that. I mean, light years beyond that. Well, I would start by taking the CEO on a visit to the Bronx Zoo to look at the brontosauruses uh, and then point out there are no brontosauruses in the zoo or allosauruses because there's nothing that says you get the right to keep being big. So let's begin there. Uh, but the second thing is the smallest viable audience doesn't mean small. It just means smallest. So for a long time, Starbucks was on the path to be as successful as they needed to be because they didn't say we have to be as big as McDonald's. That having 50 Starbucks per town might have been smallest viable audience, right? That every town needs 50 of them, maybe even 200. But it doesn't have to be on every airplane, in every cafe, on every corner. That the problem with being public is public wants infinity and infinity wants mass and mass wants average, and that was working, and now it doesn't. And the, the math is easy to demonstrate. So where we go next, if you're Procter & Gamble, is you cannot insist that Tide be used by everyone, because Tide will not be used by everyone. What you can do is realize that with new distribution methods and your factories already in place, you can come up with 400 niche versions of ways to clean my clothes that align with the needs of various parts of the market that you want to deal with. But it is wrong to say to your customer, oh, we want to get big, so therefore we will treat you generally as opposed to we will treat you specifically. Because when you give people the chance to be treated specifically, they will take it. So you reference Jeffrey Moore's Crossing the Chasm. Uh, it's a pretty well-known book amongst marketing circles. Uh, the idea essentially is that you need to early on capture the early adopter market, and then at some point look at crossing the chasm to bridge to a much larger mainstream audience. I guess the question is, how does one go about crossing the chasm? Like, What advice do you give? What, what strategies can one uh, deploy to ensure that they can make that leap? Moore's point is early adopters want something different than the, than the masses. Early adopters want something that's new and they're nerds. Across the chasm are people who want something that works. So the Apple Newton was a big success. They sold hundreds of thousands of them to geeks. And then it failed because Doonesbury and everyone else pointed out it didn't work. And so 
the way you cross the chasm is A, you make something that works, and B, you give the early adopters a high status way to talk about what you did. So if we look after the Newton comes the iPod, how did the iPod spread? Because there were MP3 players that cost one quarter as much. The way the iPod spread was it worked and it had white headphones. So what that meant was if you went to the gym, you saw lots of people working out, but you saw the nerdy, smart, tech-friendly people wearing white headphones. So that every time you wore an iPod, you were sending a message to the world that said, I'm smarter than you because I went first, and a message to the world that said, if you're looking for a portable player that you're going to be happy with, get the one with the white headphones. It was public. It spread as it worked. And so this network effect, building a fax machine, that becomes key. If you had to think of an example of a, a sizable company, you know, again, a, a major, major corporation, you know, Fortune 500, Fortune 1000, uh, who really gets it? You know, a company which has created uh, an influential, high-impact brand doing it the right way. Like, what, what comes to mind? Who's an example that you really admire? I think that we see a textbook example of how to do this at Netflix, right? So sure, Netflix does its own fair share of hype and promo and even advertising, but Netflix is a network effect business that has grown by treating different people differently. They have created conversations. They have built right into the heart of what they do assertions about who they, it's for and who it's not for. Uh, they don't make shows for everybody. The shows they make wouldn't do well on CBS and the shows they make aren't the pandering that you see on YouTube. There's a specific kind of Netflix experience. And by understanding who their users are and treating different people differently, they continue to increase the trust and attention they get from each user. And then they turn around and invest heavily in keeping the promise they just made. So just to switch gears for a moment, let's talk about personal branding. What exactly is the Seth Godin brand? And, and maybe help frame it in the context of this discussion. Like what is your market and what isn't your market? Okay, so a brand isn't a logo. A brand is a promise. It's an expectation of what you're going to get. So if Nike opened a hotel, I think we could guess what it would be like. But if Hyatt came out with a brand of sneakers, we'd have no clue what that would be like. Because Hyatt has a logo, but they don't have a brand. And I would like to think that when people tune into my blog tomorrow or listen to this podcast or take one of my seminars, they're not bored by what they see, but they're not surprised by it either. In the sense that I'm saying to a very small group of people, maybe a million, maybe 2 million, which is a rounding error when you think about how many people there are on earth. I believe a set of things. I'm going to point out things to you that you probably already knew, but you didn't realize. And I'm going to give you tools that you can use to go where you want to go. And I'm going to do it in a certain tone of voice. And I'm going to do it with a certain uh, care, but I'm not going to have all the sizzle that someone else might have. And I'm not going to have, you know, this sort of angry or profane or cynical point of view that some people have. The other thing you're going to know is I did it, not a team of people, not uh, a corporation. That's what I promise. And that's what I've been doing for a really long time. As a result, I've never had one blog post that's been the most popular post on the internet. And I've never maximized my income because I'm not trying to max my income. I'm trying to maximize trust and forward motion. I read that you once turned down an opportunity to be on Oprah. Is that really true? It was early in the interaction. It wasn't like tomorrow you can be on Oprah. But yes, I made the decision that uh, at that point in my career, the price that I would pay to be in front of that many people with a message that would resonate for them would take me away from the work I was trying to do for the people I was trying to serve. You felt you might have to dilute your message to appeal to this wider audience. I mean, was that what you were really worried about? I'm not sure dilute is the right word, but yeah. You know, there's a charity that I work with that had a chance to be on Oprah. And 
that means $20 million in donations. And I beg them not to do it. I say, because here's what happens. If you go from having an average donation of $100,000 to having an average donation of $20, you get hooked on that. You, get, you build an organization that's good at $20 donations. And you can never get back to where you were. And so you got to pick your slot. And you got to pick your slot and stay in your slot because even though it's tempting to say, now I'm going to go get a million Instagram followers, that's going to make you do a different thing in a different way. And as long as you're up for that, you should go do it. But if you're not up for it, you shouldn't believe that everything's going to be the same except more because that's rarely true. One of the challenges, I guess, is, you know, we're living in this day and age where people, especially, you know, younger people care so much about fame and recognition, you know, it's the sense of the Kardashian effect. And, you know, it's hard to essentially walk away from the potential to have this broad uh, global audience and focus on something uh, much more specialized. It's hard you got to keep coming back to what's it for? This work you're doing, what's it for? Because if your goal is to make the maximum amount of money, you should probably go to Goldman and exploit developing world countries. You shouldn't do the work you're currently doing because that's not the way to make the most money. You talk in the book how people don't generally know what they want, that it's our job to watch people, to figure out what they dream of, and then create a transaction that can deliver that feeling. So if it's about fulfilling an emotional need that works pretty much at the subconscious level, I guess at that point, market research, you might as well throw it out the door. So I guess the question is, you know, how do we tap into that? If people don't know what they want, well, how do we know what they want? Well, we don't know. We assert, right? How does a chef know that she should add, uh, you know, a vegan cashew pie to the menu if someone's never had a vegan cashew pie? That's her job, to assert, to be able to have the insight and wisdom to say, I know these people and I'm betting that people like this will want something like that. That is our craft to assert that. We can't test our way into it because we're talking about cultural change. You can't ask somebody if they want it because they don't know. But what you can do is say, people want A, B, and C, in my experience, often want D. And that's the hard part. There's no map. So in your experience, Seth, you know, to have that real empathy, does a marketer need to almost you know, define themselves within that subset of the audience they're serving? Or can they completely be outside of that and still be able to relate? Relate in such a way that they can create really meaningful uh, relationships uh, in a dialogue. So the easiest way to do this is to have empathy for yourself and market to yourself and assert that there are people like me. And so if I make something I want, then other people will want it. That makes it really difficult to make stuff for kids. It makes it really difficult for men to make pantyhose. It makes something really, I mean, there's lots of ways that that doesn't really work. To be truly professional at it is to get past the self mirror thing and to be able to truly see others. And you can do that with practice. You know, one of the challenges that nonprofit fundraisers have is they have no idea what it's like to have a hundred million dollars. So when they're sitting there trying to, to, to sell a building in a college for $500,000 donation. They're like, I would never give $500,000 to have a name on a building. Yeah, because you're not worth $100 million. To someone with $100 million, $500,000 is a bargain. And you're, if by not asking them, you're taking from them because they would have paid $700,000 to have a name on a building. You're giving them this huge upside because the only thing left for them to buy is ego satisfaction and you're offering to sell it to them. But if you can't imagine what it's like, then you can't be a nonprofit fundraiser. I think if I recall in the book, you mentioned that you're a pretty rabid Grateful Dead fan. Yeah, I have hundreds of uh, records from them, yeah. You know, you brought them up as this really interesting example, uh, an example you truly admire about the right way to cultivate a market and build a business. You know, one of having a really nice scalable business, but yet still staying true to your mission and, and never violating that. 
So could you share that? Like, what is the secret to their success? You know, you talked a little bit earlier about what it means to be big and not just to be some little corner hobby shop. The dead generated half a billion dollars in revenue during their career. Every single member of the entourage has more money than they would ever need. Half a billion dollars. There are plenty of companies that are uh, rapacious and selfish that don't come close to that. So what did they do? Well, the first thing they did was the smallest viable audience was only 100,000 people. They didn't need that many people to follow them around to be able to have an impact. The second thing they did was the music was free, meaning please tape our concert. Please give the tapes away. Here, something to share, something to talk about. Most bands didn't know how to do that. The concert, that's what they sold. Who was at the concert? People like us doing things like this. If you wanted to see the others, you had to come. That was the only place you could see the others. So what the dead did for 20 solid, really good years was put on a party for the tribe. And that's why people came because the other people were there. And you can do that and have a significant cultural impact without touching a lot of people. But if you still are stuck on this mindset of scarcity and mass, you'll never get there. Seth, the name of this podcast is The Art of Excellence. So when you think about that word, excellence. What comes to mind? What does the word mean to you? Tom Peters. It's Tom's thing. And Tom was very clear. I've known him for a long time. Quality has a very specific meaning. Quality is meeting spec. Excellence is not about quality. Excellence is about humanity. It's about caring. It's about showing up as a person and saying, I made this and I can make it better. It's about getting away from this mindset of being a cog in a machine and instead saying, I see you, period, as Tom would say. Well, it's interesting, Seth. I asked you at the very beginning about why you sometimes define yourself uh, as a teacher. Uh, And I feel like I've sat here for the last 40 minutes or so being an incredibly engaged student. I mean, I learned a ton from the book. And uh, I just learned a lot more just talking to you one-on-one. So uh, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for doing what you do. And uh, once again, the book is called This is Marketing. You can't be seen until you learn to see. Highly, highly recommend it. Seth, uh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for being on the show. Well, thanks for doing it. Week in and week out. It's really appreciated. Keep making a ruckus. Hey, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. You can subscribe to the show at iTunes, Stitcher, and theartofexcellence.com. I've got one small favor to ask. If you like the show, please take a minute and leave us a review on iTunes. I would really appreciate that. I'll see you next time.